Welcome. Welcome to Lighting for Profits with Ryan Lee, your number one source for all things landscape lighting. From lighting design, install, sales and marketing, we discuss everything you need to know to start and grow a successful landscape lighting business. What is up? What is up? Welcome to the number one landscape lighting show in the world, Lighting for Profits, here on Turfs Up Radio. We are live on Facebook, live on YouTube, and of course, live on Turfs Up Radio. I want to thank you for joining in, whether you're listening or watching or listening to the podcast afterwards. So grateful for you. This is so fun, you guys. I really feel like I got the best job in the world right now. If you are looking to start or grow a landscape lighting business or division, then you are definitely in the right place. It's a lot of fun, you guys. This is so fun. Today's show is going to be such a good show. This is like, we we have one of, if, if not the, the largest influencer, I'm just going to say it. It's it, She's got to be the largest influencer in landscape lighting history on the show today with us here today, Miss Janet Lennox Moyer. That's right. So make sure you guys stick around because I mean, I am so excited to have her on. I've got, I was telling her, uh, we were just chatting real quick before. I'm like, I've got about four hours of questions that I've got to somehow figure out to ask you in this very short window. <laughs> so if you guys have questions, make, make sure to join the conversation and get onto Facebook, get onto YouTube and ask the questions as, so that we can get those answered for you. As a quick reminder, Lighting for Profits is available on all the podcast platforms to make sure you just subscribe so that you can get access to the episodes early, early on. And uh, as a quick reminder as well, a lot of people requesting access to my private Facebook page, Landscape Lighting Secrets. Unfortunately, that is only for paid members of Landscape Lighting Secrets coaching program. But I do have a free group, Landscape Lighting Mastermind. So go uh, jump on there and join the conversation. And of course, I want to thank my mug sponsor, Garden Light LED. Oh, yeah. Uh, listen, I want to give you guys, uh, before we have Jan, uh, before I welcome her into the studio here, I want to get, give you just a quick recap of this last week. I had the opportunity to go down to Tampa and uh, hung out with a bunch of lighting, lighting guys, lighting geeks, right? We were geeking out. It was a Christmas light uh, show by uh, Holiday Bright Lights. They had their kickoff event. It was my first time going, and uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was so, so cool. Uh, you know, I'm in the past, I've, I'm guilty of not going to these types of events. I really uh, have missed out. I'm telling you, like, I, I never really saw the value. I was just too busy working. I was too busy working in my business that I never went to these networking events and these conferences and everything else. And I'm just telling you, I missed out because I got so much value by attending this event. And listen, I, I mean, you, you meet new people. I met a ton of new people that I'd never even heard of or never met. I uh, met a lot of people that, you know, were like Facebook friends, but never met in person. So that was cool. And, uh, you know, Holiday Bright Lights, they just, they know how to put on a show. They, they brought so much stuff down there. I mean, they completely transformed this ugly, boring room into a Holiday Bright Lights kickoff event. So it was really, really good. But, uh, you know, I met a lot of people and, there were some people that reminded me of my old self and I would ask them, how are things going? What'd you take away from the conference? How, you know, what's your favorite thing? And they're kind of like Debbie Downers, like, well, you know, I, you know, I didn't like this and I didn't like this. And I'm like, Hey, I didn't ask you what you didn't like. I asked you what you did like. And I understand like if someone, you know, I have a speaker up there that, you know, talks for, you know, let's say an hour or even 30 minutes, whatever it is, there's a lot of stuff that might be, you know, repeat information, or it might be something that you don't find relevant or whatever else. But, I always encourage people to take one thing, okay? Especially when I get up on stage, I'm like, listen, I'm going to talk about a lot of different stuff. Just take one thing that you can actually execute and implement on today, right? And so um, that's my biggest takeaway is if you're going to go to conferences, if you're going to uh, read a book, if you're going to buy a program, if you're going to uh, do anything like that, don't focus on everything it's not going to do for you, but find, you know, instead of the 99 things that it doesn't do, Find the one thing that's going to be a game changer. Find that one thing that's going to take you to the next level. Because I promise with this conference, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I was like, eh, 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 whatever. But there was huge takeaways. 
you know, someone gets up there and talks for 20, 30 minutes. Maybe, maybe you know most of that stuff, but there's one thing that they say that is just a game changer. And if you miss that because you're sitting there focused on all the negative things, then that's on you, right? That's on you. So uh, focus not on the 99 things that you're not getting out of something. And, and it, rather than that, focus on the one thing that you are going to get away. So it, it's up to you because I can promise you this. There were a ton of those, you know, one things that you get from this conference. It was, it was fantastic. So, I mean, just the ability to meet these people in person, pick their brains, what's working for you, what's not. And these, you know, these business owners are willing to share all this valuable information that's taken them years and years and years to learn. Why not? Uh, why not learn from them? Right. So just even if you take one overall idea or some, you know, game changing thing, just think about the effect, the positive effect it's going to have on yourself and your business just by implementing that one thing. So, and then, you know, you can form a lot of new relationships too. So, you know, I met people, like I said, some I'd never even heard of and some I'd heard of, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like I, we're friends now. I have your cell phone. You know, if, if you get in, if you get into a, a struggle or a, you know, a question or something like that, and you're like, man, I wonder what this guy would do. Now you, now you can reach out. Right. And the cool thing about this is when you, when you build your, your business like this and you build your ecosystem like this, you, you basically develop a board of directors, right? And so rather than feeling like you're on your own, you know, sometimes it's lonely, the path of an entrepreneur. We're, we're, we don't know what to do. And, and we have questions, but we're embarrassed to ask because it's like, man, I've been doing this a long time. I should know the answer, right? And that's embarrassing. I mean, we're, we're normal, we're human. But if you can develop these relationships with, you know, two, three, four, five, even 10 people, you could, they can be, they can act as your sounding board. They can act as your board of directors, your board of trustees. So that let's say you, you're, you're having, you're having a hard time, right? You can go to them and be vulnerable with them and they can talk you off the ledge, right? Some people in business, they tend to, um, instead of solving a problem, they tend to run away from it. And, and I think that building relationships will really help you with this. And let me explain why. Let's say you have a landscape lighting business and it slows down and you're like, well, man, I used to have, you know, so much, so many leads, you know, word of mouth. That's really all I did. It was good. And then it gets slow rather than solving that problem. I, here's what I see a lot of people do. Instead of staying the course and doing landscape lighting, which is their thing. That's the thing that you're supposed to be passionate about. Instead of solving that problem of how to get busier they decide to pivot. They try to transition into something else. You know, I got a lot of customers asking me about landscaping. I got a lot of customers asking me about outdoor living, outdoor kitchens, pools, all these other things. Oh, my buddy does roofing. He does well. Maybe I'll get into something else. And instead of staying the course, they're like, yeah, landscape lighting is just not what it, it's just not what it used to be. It slowed down. So I decided to get into landscaping. I decided to gain an outdoor kitchen or I decided to do something else and, and have another direction. But I promise you, that's not the right answer most of the time. And if you develop a network, develop these relationships and have your kind of own board of advisors, you're going to go to them and say, hey, guys, I'm just slow. You know, I'm thinking about doing this. And uh, I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to talk you out of it and say, what? <laughs> you're a landscape lighting guy. <laughs> Now, now you want to get into outdoor kitchens? What does that have to do? Like, no, I thought you were. And, and so again, rather than run away from the problem and create new ones, you're going to solve the problem at hand. Okay. And it helps, it helps stay the course. You know, you're, you've got this course and instead of, you know, you're going to always veer a little bit off, right? But they're going to pull you back in. So I highly recommend attending these events. There's so many different trainings and seminars and conventions and everything else where you can go and meet new people and develop these relationships. Um, uh, there was, there was someone I was talking to, it was, it was just a small group of us. And we were talking about, uh, you know, challenges of being a business owner, stuff like that. And employees came up and some people were like, oh man, I hate employees and da, da, da. And when I hear that, I'm like, really? Like, I love employees. I hate the things they do <laughs> sometimes, but I love employees because they've allowed me to scale. They've allowed me to become a true business owner and an entrepreneur because I can't do all the things that all my employees can do. And so I love employees. And when I find something that I hate that they're doing, I reflect on myself and be like, how could I, 
how can I mitigate this issue? How, what, what, how can I solve that problem, right? And, and instead of complaining, I look for solutions. And one guy had a really good analogy. He said, no, I, I, I'm grateful for our employees too. It's all about teamwork. And he brought up, he's like, look, you look at Tom Brady. Great quarterback, right? I mean, he goes, to, from, he goes from the Patriots to the, the Bucks, and the first year wins the Super Bowl. Like, pretty dang good player. But honestly, Tom Brady cannot do it on his own. He, he may be the greatest quarterback, but he's got to throw the ball to somebody. You know, he, he doesn't get those touchdowns on his own. And I, I, I just had that thought, like, can you imagine Tom Brady going back, throw the ball as high as he can, and then running down as fast as he can and catching the ball. And then he's got to block. He's got to get some blockers. So he's got to block for himself and get it and run and get the touchdown. Like, he can't do that on his own. And so it's not just about even the players on the field. There's backups and there's coaches and there's trainers and there's office staff and all these people that creates the team and makes Tom Grady look great. I'm sure, but he can't win on his own and you can't win on your own. So, uh, you, you're going to need employees. You're going to need relationships. You're going to need other people to, to lean on. Right. And that's one of the greatest things that I love about this show uh, is that I get to have guests on, like Jan Moyer. She's coming on here in just literally a couple minutes, and uh, you know, pick their brains and see like what, what, why do you do what you do, and how do you do it? And, and it's just it's fascinating to have these people on here and to be able to have access to literally decades of experience. It's it's truly tremendous. So I hope you guys are enjoying this show. I hope you're enjoying. Uh, the value that these guests are bringing because it is phenomenal. Truly, truly phenomenal. All right, so uh, I guess we're to that point. So what we're going to do is uh, take a quick break. I tried to make these breaks even shorter today because we got a lot of t a lot to accomplish with Jan, uh, and she's going to be joining us in just a couple minutes. So guys, stick around. Lighting for Profits here on Turf Stop Radio. We'll be right back with the one, the only, Miss Jan Moyer. Hey, landscape bros, are you tired of digging through rocks and roots and breaking shovels in the process? Then it's time you checked out the Geo Ripper 616. It's a landscaper's dream with the Makita 6 Series two cycle engine producing over four horsepower of raw performance. The 616 digs deep in up to 16 inches of the toughest soil. Sliding landscape and irrigation contractors already love this improved lightweight trencher with its ability to get in and get out faster, easier, and with less ground disturbance. And you you will too. This redesigned Geo Ripper 616 comes with two heavy duty digging chains and a whole mess of helpful extras. To learn more about the Geo Ripper and how it can help you out in the field, visit georipper.com today. Are you a military family with a spouse on deployment away from home? Did you know that nonprofit Project Evergreen has thousands of volunteers across the country ready to help military families with lawn, landscape, and snow removal services? We call it Green Care and Snow Care for Troops. If you are a military family and would like to receive this free service, or if you'd like to volunteer to help, visit projectevergreen.org. Project Evergreen, creating a greener, healthier, cooler earth, one yard at a time. Isn't it nice when the weather cooperates and crews complete jobs on time and on budget? But weather can cause delays. And with paper route sheets, jobs get lost in the shuffle. That's why you need Aspire Crew Control Scheduling Software, an easy to use, flexible and affordable solution that allows you to shift schedules with a single click. Try Aspire Crew Control for free at aspirecrewcontrol.com. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to Lighting for Profits here on Turf Up Radio. We are joined now. I want to welcome to the studio Miss Jan Moore. How are you, Jan? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing 
much better now that I see you here with me. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Oh, honestly, it's my pleasure. And uh, I want to tell everyone listening, this was a little bit of a risk on my end because I reached out to Jan a while ago and she said, yeah, I'd love to do it, but I've got jury duty, duty the day before. And I was like, you know what? Let's go with the risk. I'm just going to pray that she doesn't get selected. And I was pleasantly relieved when I uh, found got word this morning that you were not selected for ju jury duty. I was released. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. I am truly uh, grateful for you to take time out of your day to be here. I'm fascinated about your story. Um, you have been able to do something that most people talk about, but are, have been unable to do, which is really be a lighting designer and um, really, you know, paint with light and all these other things. So <laughs> let's talk, let's get into that. How, how did you get into landscape lighting? Well, it, you know, everything starts with an odd thing. And my odd thing is that when I was a teenager, some of my friends and I would play a street game where the first person to hide when a car was coming won. And I would look at the lights hitting, the headlights of a car hitting the overhead lines. And I would always win. And I never told anybody. So that was my first inkling about lighting. I never thought about lighting like most people don't. Then I was fortunate enough to be an exchange student for a summer, <clears throat> excuse me, in Greece. And we went to a nighttime light show at the Acropolis. That was just amazing. And I just filed that in the back of my head and I went off to college. And I was fortunate enough to have to take, in my program, I had to take one class in lighting. And I'd never heard of anyone being in lighting. What is that? What does that mean? Right. Uh, I loved this class. And my senior year, I asked the professor if I could be um, his um, student helper. And um, so I got to do that. And this class always went to the General Electric Lighting Institute for a field trip. And when we were at the Lighting Institute, I asked Jim Jensen, Jim Jensen, excuse me, the manager, if I could come and work there when I graduated. And he said, yep. So I called him in the, the following spring and I said, okay, I'm gonna graduate in August. I'll be available in September. And he said, great, I've been holding the job for you. So imagine for every day I could sit in and listen to eight or 10 lectures on lighting. <laughs> and I could listen to the same lecture every day if I wanted to. I learned so much. And within a few months, the manager, Jim Jensen, asked me if I would please start teaching some of the classes. He would only let me teach students. So, um, and there were two ways that I did it. I would give a big lecture in the big auditorium. So I got to use all of GE's slides and a lot of them were bad. So I learned about bad lighting as well as good lighting. And, you know, there was, there's always people that help you. So Jim Jensen helped me and um, a man named Peter Shelko helped me put my first lecture together from the GE um, art department. And at this time, was this all interior lighting or was it out exterior lighting as well? I, I started out doing all lighting and at GE it was all lighting. But the other thing that I did, they had a big room that was set up with um, a bunch of interior spaces and a garden. And I got to hear the, there was only one person that talked about landscape lighting and I just loved it. So one day I'm teaching in that room and there's a man named Jim Benya who had brought his students to uh, the Institute for the day. Do you know who Jim Benya is? Nope. <laughs> big, big name in, in lighting. And he's standing in the back saying to the, to the other people that worked at the Institute, who is that? And unfortunately, uh, my job was a temporary job. It was, it was during the school year. So it was from September till June. And this was now May. So I was about to lose my job. And I've, actually I'd forgotten, I was only hired for three months. And at the end of the first three months, they asked if I'd stay. And so I ended up there till May. And so Jim uh, asked me if I would be interested in uh, considering going to Smith Henchman and Grills in Detroit, which at that time had the most important lighting group in the country. They were, as a matter of fact, Dave Delora was writing Lumen 2, which was the first um, computer control, computer, computer program about calculations for lighting. 
And so I was looking at jobs in New York and Pennsylvania, and I went and interviewed with Steve Scolacci. Oh, man. <laughs> that man, my second father. So I was there for eight hours interviewing. And I'm still doing all lighting. My first job, though, was uh, the Detroit Civic Center with Asamu Noguchi. <laughs> that was my first job at, at Smith Engineering and Grills. And eventually I realized that, that being someone that studied interior design, I needed a lot more information than I had gotten in college, even though I took classes in engineering and architecture when I was there, but I still needed more. One of the things that I needed was marketing. So I left the lighting group and went and worked in the marketing group at Smith Henchman. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So along the way, um, there were things that helped besides the pieces I've told you about so far. One of them was that I was the, I was selected as the uh, representative for the state of Michigan to attend the ASID national conference in Los Angeles, the uh, summer between my junior year and my senior year. And so um, I went and I, the first lunch, I sat at a big round table with across the table from a woman named Fran Kellogg Smith who was one of three women practicing lighting in 1976, <laughs> 1975, excuse me, 1975. And um, I asked her a whole bunch of questions and she just tucked me under her wing and helped me un understand what I was getting into and what I needed to think about and how I needed to prepare for this long-term job that I was signing up for of lighting. And that same year when I was uh, the student assistant in the lighting class, I also had met, um, uh, God, what's his name? Hmm. A lighting designer from New York City. And I called him up and asked if I could come and do an internship with him um, over the winter break. And uh, he said that his lawyer wouldn't allow it. And I was just amazed. But two years later, he called me and told me that the IALD, the International Association of Lighting Designers, had started a program for people like me to come and get an internship because of my calling him. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it so is cool. The thing that I'm thinking about in answering your question is that all through life, there are all kinds of people that help us, especially if we ask questions. So that goes back to what you were saying before about we just need to get what we can out of every experience, every conference that we go to. And with all the people that we meet, don't be afraid to ask questions. Most everybody wants to help. 100%. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this. With lighting design, is it something that can be learned or is it something like you're born with it and then you can learn it? You know, it's kind of like an athlete. There's the great athletes that obviously they're born with a little bit more talent, but how, how do we, cause I know some people have expressed like, man, I was in this training with Jan and I was like, oh man, I'm not in her league. And that's how I feel. I'm like, man, I ran a pretty dang successful landscape lighting business. But when it comes to design, I'm just like, oh. Yeah, yeah but, but that's when you want to learn from people that have that knowledge that you don't have. And so here's what I think about that question. Lighting is both brains. It's left and right brain. We've got to know the technical and we have to apply it uh, in our decisions about concepts and our selection of fixtures and how we're going to do the wiring and a whole lot of ways. And then there's also the design. And the design is what allows us to enjoy the night. So here's what I think about your, your wondering if everybody can do it. No, not everybody has the eye. And that's where I see it. It's a design sense. You have to be able to see the relationship of brightnesses from one element to another and be able to organize them. And can if you, you do that though, I'm sorry, can that be taught? No, can't be taught. It can't, it can be taught to people that have it. Like I had it so people could right. teach me and I taught myself most of it, but a lot of people taught me too. So if it's, if you have the design instinct in you, it can be taught. If you don't, you can't. It, you can, it's like knocking your head against a wall. That doesn't mean you can't be involved in, light, in landscape lighting because we need a whole lot of technical people that can help us with the schedules, um, the wiring 
calculations, all kinds of making sure that everything gets put together properly. Okay. Everything. So, so it's not just designers and the understanding of design that's necessary. Okay. And how do you judge uh, one's design ability? The way that I do it is first I will look at whatever portfolio they present if, if I'm interviewing someone or their their website, look at their photographs. And that's, of course, difficult because what if they don't have a good photographer? Right. Uh, that doesn't show your uh, work well if you don't have a good photographer. But then the most important thing is to take them out in the field and have them work with you to see if they get it. I mean, because most people, when they start, they don't know what they're doing. So they obviously don't get it. So they have it. Recommend, like, let's say I, I'm a, a new guy getting into landscape lighting. I love the, the technical aspect of it and everything else. And I love the, the being a business owner. Would you say then it would be in it? But I'm not that lighting designer. Then I need to be looking for a lighting designer to to run the cells for me, basically. Yeah. Um, I don't have an install uh, organization. Mine is just designed. So I work with installers. So your that business model is a little different from mine. So I don't, I don't do sales and design and I don't understand the difference. I have to say it up front. Um, I think that you, what you need is people that can do both jobs. They can do the conceptual design and sell it. So they might feel more comfortable doing sales, but be able to understand what can be given to a client. So they can walk the client through the site and say that we could um, do this kind of effect or that kind of effect. And then they would need to share that with the people that are actually going to do the design, unless the salesman actually does the design, in which case then he needs to translate his vision to the people that are installing it, especially if he's not going to be there with them at night doing the aiming. And one of the most important thing that I think a lot of people don't understand, I do as much design at night during aiming as I do all the rest of the program. That's when mo that's when the magic happens. When you're out there at night making just a little tweak or a big tweak or a lot of tweaks uh, to get the lighting to be just the best that it can be. And so, I mean, even today, are you still out doing those final nighttime walkthroughs? It's not a walkthrough. It's an aiming session. Um, I just finished a project in New York with Brooke uh, Silber, who used to be my partner, and she now works for an engineering company. But we had uh, gotten this project together, and so we wanted to finish it together. The two of us were out there from, from dark until 1 o'clock most nights in May uh, for a week trying to get it. And there was, it was a big project. There were a lot of fixtures and we had eight people um, that were part of the install team that were helping us. So yeah, we spend a lot of time out in the dark at night, making it right. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. It is. It is. It's enough uh, changes where you're, it's not just you and one other person. I mean, you'll have like the installation team out there. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, on every project that I've ever been on, there are constant changes from the time you first get the conceptual drawings or look at the site, uh, all kinds of things change. Well, in this particular project, two big things changed. The designer, the landscape designer uh, decided to add a whole bunch of mature trees on one boundary. Let's call it the left boundary on the right hand boundary. They'd already put in some trees, but they were all going to come out because the, the the owners had just finished purchasing the next door property and they bought it so that they could tear down the house next door and improve their view. So those two things were happening the week that we were there to make the final aiming adjustments. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always, it, the timing is always perfect like that. But there's always something like that. It might not be as yeah. big. If, if it's a much smaller project, it might be the tree died or they added a tree or you realize you need four fixtures instead of three. It can be just a little thing, but there's always something. One question I have for you, I would go and do these projects and I knew from a design standpoint what it needed. I was like, this is going to look phenomenal. But it also presented a challenge with like practicality and function. How, how do you navigate that dilemma of like, do I choose the fixture that's best for the design or do I use the fixture that's best for function? 
Well, that's an odd question to me because I think if you choose the right fixture for the effect, it will be the right fixture. Now, a side part of that could be that some fixtures are are more maintenance um, uh, hogs than others. Um, and so if you've got a situation, especially a commercial situation, where there just won't be the maintenance, then you have to scale back um, what you do with your design in order to not have it be, um, the, I think of landscape lighting projects as helicopters. The minute you turn on a helicopter, it's going to try and destroy itself. The minute you walk away from a landscape lighting project after you've done the aiming, something is constantly going wrong. So how can you limit that? One of the ways you limit that is with fixtures that are really good quality and can hold an aim. They've got to have a good tightening mechanism so that if it gets knocked by a shovel or a, a vehicle, it doesn't lose its aim. And that's not just the locking mechanism, it's also the stake. You need to have a really solid based stake so that it can't get knocked out of adjustment. So those are the kinds of things that I think about the more you think about including uh, stuff like that that can make the fixture a stronger fixture, the more expensive it becomes. So if you if you can't do that, I don't ever try to sacrifice the quality of the fixture. What I will do is limit the expense, the extent of the design. So I'll do one area really well and I'll work with the client on what's most important to them. And we'll do that one area. Maybe it's the view out the kitchen window or maybe it's the front yard. It, it could be anything. Yeah. Whatever it is, do that really well so that as they um, can afford more, they can keep adding to their landscape lighting, which is great for you because that means you have continued work over the years. Yeah, I've been working on some of my projects for 20, 30 years. That's awesome. Well, I want to take a quick break and I want to ask you more about that because it does come up. You know, do we lead with like this huge, massive design of what's what the possibilities are or do we try to take it off in bite sized segments? So I love that. We're going to take a quick break, guys, and we'll be right back with Jan Moore. We want to thank the Lawn and Landscape community for making GIE Plus Expo their place to reunite as an industry. Like a family reunion, thousands of dealers, landscape pros, and contractors return annually to network, share ideas, learn best practices, and make new friends. It all starts Wednesday, October 20th with the opening reception and continues into the night with free concerts in downtown Louisville. At the show, you'll have the opportunity to share experiences and brainstorm new approaches to your business challenges with friends and like-minded professionals. You don't don't want to miss the opening keynote, Secrets of Being an Effective Leader, presented by retired Navy four-star Admiral James Tavridis. Register now at GIE-Expo.com, and we'll see you October 20th through the 22nd in Louisville. Hey, everybody. It's Brooke Ford, host of The Green Veteran here on Turf Up Radio. Be sure to check me out every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. You're going to hear some great one-on-one -on -one interviews with green industry professionals. We're going to talk about best business practices, highlight innovative products, and also provide some insight into some new emerging technologies in the field. That's The Green Veteran airing each Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And remember, Turfs Up Radio, your industry, your station. Hey, this is Jeff Hester, senior contributor and co-host of the Weekend Review here on Tursa Radio. Can't make it to major green industry events, but want to stay connected? Don't worry, we have you covered. Be sure to download the Tursa Radio app or visit our website. We'll bring you the live coverage you need to keep you up to date with everything that happens in our industry. And to find out where we'll be next, simply visit greenindustryevents.com. That's greenindustryevents.com. And always remember, Tursa Radio, your industry, your station. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Welcome back. I'm Ryan Lee, your host of Lighting for Profits here on Turf Up Radio, and I'm joined with Miss Jan Moore. So thank you again for being here. Um, we were talking a little bit before the break about kind of how you break up the projects, but it actually led me to another question. You know, most people are not able to get to the point in their career where they 
like we feel like we have to install it like how, how would we just go do a design like we, we i don't think many people around the world have figured out how to truly become a landscape lighting designer you know like i would call me and my salespeople lighting designers but we were doing it to install it ourselves so how did you get to that point where you can just start charging for your designs and management of the project well, I have a terrible answer to that question. That's the way it's always been with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I've seen a lot of people, you know, I've I founded ILLI, the International Landscape Lighting Institute, and a lot of people that came to that started out in irrigation with an interest in lighting and several of them, maybe several dozen of them have become just landscape lighting designers. Um, and yep. it's, a, it's a matter of learning how to present yourself and how important landscape lighting design is. Uh, it, it could start every night and we have the opportunity to really affect people's quality of life. It became really clear during COVID when nobody went anywhere and we all stayed home. Um, people's homes get disconnected from their landscape at night all year, not just in the dark months, um, but all year if we don't have landscape lighting. So it's a, it's something that allows us to have our entire space become uh, united and for us to be able to use that entire space. Even in the winter in cold places or here, even in the summer in hot places where we don't go out in July and August, but we still want to be connected with our gardens. So it's a matter of the way you present yourself um, and if you have, if you've been doing installation, then you can, if you're not the person like you were suggesting perhaps earlier, have train someone or have someone come into your company that can do that and let them be the lead person that goes out and works with clients uh, to help them understand what can be done and help them understand how it can be done in pieces, parts and pieces, um, if they need that. One of the things that I've often done is do an overall um, grand design for the whole property, but show it in pieces that, and make sure people understand they all these pieces have to work together so we can pick any part of that to start. And the great thing about landscape lighting is once we have power out in the landscape, we can keep adding to it forever. So let's say you have a brand new project, a brand new house being built. The most important thing that you do as a landscape lighting designer is get power distributed. You may not do anything else for the first two or three years. Just get the power infrastructure uh, all the way through where you think you're going to want landscape lighting to be so that you never have to dig up the garden again. Gotcha. That's interesting. So when you go and do that, you'll give them almost like a master plan. A master plan. Yep. Here's all the possibilities. And then yep. let's start with whatever your priority is. Yep. And how often do you have people saying, I don't want to break this down. I just want it all. It really depends. It depends on on where those people are financially and where they are in their life. Um, so I think everyone would rather do that if they could, but not everybody can. And many of us in this business understand that we can't do it all. We have to work on it. So it just depends. And and quite frankly, I think it's better to do it over a longer period of time because then the problem is less um, onerous for you in the beginning. And it allows you to really build your relationship with the client over time. Many of my relation, my clients have become very good friends over time. We've even gone on trips together. So uh, that's a really good way to cement a long-term business client. And yeah, I mean, you've done, you've got, you've done lighting designs all over the world, right? Like what's, yep. what's some, of, what's a location that people would be like, wow, I, I didn't know you did work there. <laughs> Well, I'm working on a little farmhouse in quotes right now in Saudi Arabia. A little farmhouse in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Farmhouse, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not doing the farmhouse. I'm doing the landscape lighting. And at one point, this is pretty funny, actually. The landscape architects just gave me the gardens right around the house. And I said, well, how does the owner get from the street to the front door? And they said, oh. So during COVID, they spent a year working on the landscaping from the street to the door. They found Roman ruins. They found caves. <laughs> so the project's gotten a little bigger. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So I've done work everywhere. Well, not everywhere. 
A lot of places. <laughs> and and the thing is, uh, for landscape lighting, I really believe in landscape lighting and how it affects our sanity. So if someone wants two fixtures put in, I will help them with two fixtures. I don't want to just do big projects. Big projects can be overwhelming sometimes. I did a 300 acre project, which was just the start of it. They kept adding more and more hundreds of acres. Wow. Back in the, in the mid, between 2000, 2010. And it, it was overwhelming work on that project. And I said to myself, I'm never going to do something that big again. Yeah, it takes up a lot of time. I, I've kind of gone back and forth myself over the years where it's like, man, it's always exciting to talk about them and, and, and stuff like that. But then it takes you away from helping out all these other people as well. So. Absolutely. And it takes you away from, from your house, especially if this, in this case, I lived in New York and the property was in Ohio. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks in Ohio during the day and at night, you know, uh, doing the design and doing the overseeing of the installation and the aiming. Yeah, very cool. Well, let's talk about, I know when I, when I originally did the post, I was like uh, doing some uh, super secret uh, ops on Jan and I, and I saw this article that was posted this last year. It said she'd been in the business, you know, all, uh, nearly 30 years. So that's what I posted. And she's like, uh -huh, this Wrong. is my 45th year in the business. So yeah. um, 45 years is, a, is amazing. How have you seen the, the industry progress? Like lighting design, I guess, specifically. Over the, the, the big thing time. that I've noticed in the beginning was that landscape architects didn't know about lighting. They still don't, but they, they also still don't. <laughs> no, they still don't. I don't know a single landscape architecture program in this country that has a lighting class in it. Um, but they also don't, didn't know back then about lighting designers. So a big challenge was to get landscape architects to hire landscape lighting designers. Now they all do. So that was major for us. We also can get hired by the architect or the interior designer or the owner. I've been hired by the controls designer. Um, so you, we can get hired by anybody. And so, and it's really important that we have a good network on uh, throughout the industry and on our teams. But another thing that happened was uh, this, this one you're going to love. I was doing lighting when there were no MR16 lamps. What? <laughs> there were no MR16 lamps or the others. I mean, we used PAR 38s or we used um, uh, PAR 36s. And that was literally it. PAR 38s or PAR 36s. Uh, so did we have our hands tied behind our back? So in the mid-1980s, MR16 lamps started becoming available. And in the beginning, there was two lamps, BAB. Well, which were the two? Was it BAB and ESX? It was two. I don't remember. And they cost like $20 each, which is what we now pay for uh, LED lamps in the neighborhood. And that settled down after a while. We got a lot more lamps and settled down. So when I first started working on the third edition of the landscape lighting book, I met with all of the chip manufacturers and the packagers uh, to find out when was landscape, uh, excuse me, when was the introduction of LED going to settle down. And this was in 2010 and they said 10 to 20 years. So we're 11 years into that and it's not settling down. Well, that's bizarre. Nothing has ever taken this long to settle down. So we're just in a brave new world. And as we all know, there are good things and bad things about LED. Let me, can I talk about a couple of what I think are the really good things about LED for a minute? Uh, uh, what if I say no? Okay. I'm just kidding. No, I would love to hear it. <laughs> okay. So I think one of the best things about LED is it saves us so much energy. It saves us between 70 to 90% of the energy that we used to put in. So anybody that's working on an existing project, you've got so much flexibility. You can do anything. Uh, the next thing that I think is really amazing that we have with landscape lighting that we never had before with what I now lovingly call old technology is a fixture that can dim at the fixture, not part of the control system. You can dim the candle power output, not the lumen output, the candle power output. It includes the lumen output, of course, um, of that fixture individually from every other fixture and really get exactly the effect that you want. And there are fixtures that have what is, um, generously called flex beam, where you can not only change the output of the amount of light, but you can change the beam spread. 
that is something we never had. And we were working on that in this project in New York. And it saved us so much time in the aiming. And it's going to save us so much time in the future because we can continue as the garden grows and gardens continually evolve, trees grow, things get added and deleted. So lighting has to be continually looked at over time. That kind of flexibility with the fixture, whether we're using it on this tree or if that tree dies, we move it to another fixture, we still can do whatever we want with it. So would you say then it's the design techniques and concept have stayed pretty much the same, but the tools that we have available to us have just changed? Nothing has changed in design. It's all the same. It's just the tools and the color. You know, one of the thing, big differences between our old technologies, typically halogen, but we didn't always use halogen. We might use metal halide. Some people even used high pressure sodium, believe it or not, or mercury vapor. Uh, but typically the difference between halogen and LED is that LED lamps, whether it's integral modules or replacement lamps, start with a bright blue uh, basis. And so the color is always going to be different than what we were used to before. We're at the point where some people may not have ever used halogen, so they may not care. Yeah. But the big difference is that it makes the color of the plant material look so much more vivid. Uh and that's just beautiful. So we've got a lot better color when we're using the right color. And that's a big question because before we didn't get to choose what color. Now we can choose from anywhere between 1900 and 3000 or 3500. Um, I won't go any higher than that. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it's cool. You're right. I mean, now we, it's interesting to just to hear, I guess, how the design principles haven't really changed too much. But like you said, we can control the candle power the beam spread you can control the, the color temperature uh at the fixture so it's it's really it's really kind of cool so all right guys i have i have uh made the executive decision to let jan moyer stay on longer because we still have even more to talk about so and I'm, i've tasked her to leave us uh with the lighting tip of the week this week so jan you've got like two minutes to come up with that in your head okay i've decided <laughs> okay cool all right guys stick around we're gonna be right back and we're gonna finish up this episode of Lighting for Profits on Turf Up Radio with Jan Moore. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. This is Hecubus from the Nightcap. I'm just sitting here relaxing within the vault with my friends and a tasty, tasty pint. You should stop by and listen in sometime. I'm here every Monday through Friday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, live, only on Turf Up Radio. Your industry, your station. Attention all pros. When you leave a deal with your clients, don't leave money on the table. Join Turf Step Nation today and partner with pros all across the country who can help you make more money for services that are related to your project. Landscapers need plumbers and pool installers need hardscapers and every combination in between. Turf Step Nation is free. Your information is secure and you will be connected with other pros in the industry that want to do business with you. Not to mention property owners who need help with just about everything. If you think your clients don't need you and the connections you have, think again. Join TurfsUpNation.com today and start putting more money in your pocket for services you never knew you could. To sign up for this free service, go to TurfsUpNation.com. Hey everybody, Wayne Vose, The Prophet, your host of Profit Time here on Turfs Up Radio. If you listen to my show, you know I'm all about profit. As an industry, profit is something we fail to meet most of the time. If you're working hard but not seeing the results that you deserve, Profits Unlimited is here to help. We offer processes and systems designed specifically to make your company more successful, more profitable, and certainly more efficient. When you're ready to take your company to the next level, reach out to me at Profits Unlimited us.com that's profits a r e u s dot com and don't forget to turn into profit time every monday wednesday and friday at 10 a.m all right all right you guys having a good time here on lighting for profits 
I've only done this one other time, but I just knew that we were going to have so many questions for Jan that I really wanted it to maximize the time we have with her. So thank you for staying lo- staying late with us, Jan. Thank you. Uh, so you've written you've written books. You've created organizations. I mean, who creates organizations? You've created organizations, trainings, all sorts of stuff. When did you know you were on to something new? Like you are, you, you've create you've is you've shaped this industry so much it's just insane so when when did you know you were on to something that was fresh well it was about back in 1988 or 89 i had this little voice in the back of my head that said i had all this information and i need to share it and i was like i don't i don't want to write a book what are you talking about so i made a deal with this little voice i'll make presentations to two or three um book publishers and if they take the bait, then I'll do the book. And unfortunately for me, all the companies that I approached wanted the book. <laughs> so, so that's how it happened. Um, and I felt even stronger as the years went on. The landscape lighting book has so much technical information in it and so much design information. I use it as a reference because uh, I'm getting so old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but going on in years, I realized it's not just book learning. You know, if you if you want to learn to paddle a canoe, you've got to get in the canoe. So that's when I realized that I had to start ILLI, the International Landscape Lighting Institute. And I didn't come up with the idea all on my own. Um, I was teaching a class at UC Berkeley first and at Rutgers at the same time. And then at... Um, the Lighting uh, Re- Research Center in New York. And I met a man named, um, oh my God, um, John Tremaine, who owns Qtran, Transformer Manufacturer. And he was the one that pushed me into starting Illy. And, you know, sometimes I thank him and sometimes I don't. Right. Um, <laughs> but the great thing is, I think about it, I shepherded it along for a number of years, but now it's going on its own. Um, and being successful and bringing people in from all over the world, which we had always done, and it's continuing to do so. So I'm very proud of it. It's a um, an organization that all it does is teach about landscape lighting, uh, and it does it through a class called <laughs> the Landscape Lighting Institute or Boot Camp. It's a five-day, four-night course, 10 to 12 hours a day, and you sit in lectures, you do Um, workshop sessions and you design and install and aim and present to the public uh, a full-scale mock-up in teams. Yeah, it's cool. Do you know when the next one is by chance? It's in October. It's been sold out for a long time because of COVID. There'll be another one in the spring, um, next coming spring. And I don't know if that one is sold out, but it would be a great, what I always recommend to people is get on the waiting list. Because yep. they may not have even opened the registration for the spring class yet. I don't know. Okay. Well, yeah, guys, go check it out. It's International Landscape Lighting Institute. Uh, and, I mean, that's uh, you're not going to find a better, more inclusive lighting design training. I mean, you can ask me questions like, what light should I put here, this, that, and the other? That's very basic, right? I mean, this is very, very detailed, hands-on. Like you said, get in the canoe and learn to paddle type course. So that's very, very cool. The cool, one of the cool things about it is that you've got everybody's fixtures and all the lamps and you can try anything you want with not having to worry about um, what what it means monetarily to either you or right. your client. Very cool. Um, let's let's talk quickly about your new book because I know you've got a new book coming out. Yes. Let's it's, hear all about it. It's called The Art of Landscape Lighting. Um, and I call it a companion book because it's all the beautiful photographs. There are some in the landscape lighting book, but it's 360 pages of beautiful photographs. There's over 800 color photographs in this book. And I think of it as an inspiration. It can be an inspiration for all of us in the industry. And it can be something that you can show to clients to say, look at this idea for your whatever area in your garden. Um, So, and it will be coming out sometime this fall. Awesome. I'm excited to have that. So I know we, it doesn't have like a published date quite yet. So maybe maybe we'll have you back on. Please. When That'd it be good. That would be and, cool. And we could show pictures and pictures and pictures. I like it. I like it. Me too. Um, do you do you have a lighting tip of the week that you want to share with us? Yep. Where I start with in my thinking, no matter how big or how small the project is, is with downlighting. 
either fixtures that I'm going to mount in a tree, a structure, or, um, you know, just up in the air somewhere with using a sky hook. Um, but the reason I start with down lighting is because it's what we're used to. We're, we're, we have accommodated to that through the sunlight that we see every day. So what it does for us is it makes the space look natural. It makes it look usable and it lights the ground plane. And the great thing about having as much down lighting as you can, and obviously you have to have both up lighting and down lighting and path lights and below grade fixtures and water fixtures and everything. But the amount of down lighting that you can do limits your maintenance because there's essentially no maintenance with fixtures that are mounted in structures or trees. You may have to cut out some branches and trees over a while, um, but there are people that go up in the trees to maintain the trees and they can do whatever maintenance needs to be done in the fixtures. You might have to work with them to understand how, which you will need to do to help them understand how to put the fixtures in the tree in the first place and help train their eye to help you do the aiming as you're doing that at, at during the day to try and get it right. And then at night, if you need to fix it at all. That was awesome. That, that was way better than any lighting tip of the week. I was going to come up for this week so thank you. Thank you for taking over. <laughs> no, you're welcome. Anytime. And I can see that a few of my buddies have been uh, watching this or listening to this. And some of them have appreciated that too. Yeah, no, they're chiming in. Mike, you know, Jeremy's saying mic drop, you know. Yes, that was sweet, Jeremy. Thank you. James loves it. Joe, hey, Joe James, I haven't seen it. you in a while. Mark, I haven't seen you in a while. So a couple, a couple of these questions were from Mark. So Mark chimed in and, and, and uh, wanted to hear a couple of things. So hopefully Mark, Mark is a good guy. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so let me ask you, I guess my last uh, question is what would you, uh, is there something that you would tell your younger self? that you wish maybe you would have done differently or sooner or later or something like that? This may not apply to everybody, but if it does apply, it's really important. You need to set your boundaries. I was not good at setting boundaries and I was working till, till sunup some days. Clients would call me all day, every day, all night, all weekend. You've got to set your boundaries so that you can have a life. You need to have a life while you're doing this. Great advice. Sheesh. Now, now we're getting deep. This is like turning in Dr. Phil because <laughs> yeah. I mean, set your boundaries in your personal life, your business, and it, it will transform your life. And uh, like you said, we're always talking about being better and working on ourselves and growing our business, but you've got to have a work-life balance for sure. So I appreciate that. This has been fun. Thank you for having me. No, you, you've you been amazing. I, I, I appreciate your insight. I appreciate your your passion. Um, and in fact, it's what, a couple of weeks, I think it's, it's two weeks from now, or maybe three, I'm going to have Michelle Mueller on, uh, as a guest and you're going to be on with her, uh, to talk about, uh, learn nightlight. So let's, let's do a little tease. <laughs> Michelle and I came up with an idea of a 20 session, um, uh, um, uh, educational series that will be on the internet and that you can do at your leisure. And it's called Learn Nightlight. Um, and she is the champion for it. And we have the first 10 are available now through the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society. And the, we have finished filming the last 10 just in the last within the last month. And they will avail, be available sometime this fall. And we'll talk more about that in a few yeah. weeks. Awesome. Very, very, very cool. So listen, thank you so much for coming on here. Um, I guess, is there any final advice you want to give to, to people or if someone wants to reach out? I mean, what, what's the best way to uh, continue the conversation, I guess? You are welcome to call me, to email me, to text me, to do anything. And I'm assuming that they can get all that information from you or do yeah, I need I to? Uh, are you on Facebook? That's my I last am not. I am not on Facebook. I am That's old. Facebook. You have to understand that I'm old. No, but here's what I learned. Facebook is for old people. I, I know. My husband has older than me, and he's met a whole lot of his <laughs> er, earlier friends from uh, different different decades. All right. So do this. If you guys want to get in touch with Jan, just shoot me an email, support at ryanleecoaching.com, and I will get you in touch with her. And uh, really, really appreciate you coming on here. I really can't thank you enough. Thank you. It's been really fun. All right, guys, listen, 
I uh, hope you enjoyed this interview. Dropped a ton of information. I was taking notes. I hope you were. And uh, I want to thank my guest, Jan Moyer. Thank you so much. And you guys have a great week. Start implementing all this stuff. That's the biggest thing. We can provide all this valuable information, but if you don't implement it, then it does no good. So go and learn how to paddle that canoe and <laughs> get going. Thanks, Jan. You guys have a good week. Thank you.